Good afternoon. My name is Jay. Thank you for the uh, kind comments from the last vlog post, guys. I hope you enjoyed the last live stream, and I'm hoping you're going to enjoy the next one coming up, and it's on Wednesdays. So today, I have a special guest for this segment, and I am on break with... I am Mark Shumsker. Hey. Mark. Thanks for taking time out of your day to join the channel. Oh, absolutely. Happy to be here. Awesome. So could you tell us a bit about how you first got working into the casino and, and where it took you throughout your time in the industry? Oh, boy. Uh, sure. So let's see. Long before I was true poker dealer on YouTube, um, I started doing online advertising for poker. This was back in uh, 2004 I started. Um, so I used to play online poker. I would play like live in casinos too. I would go to Foxwoods and Turning Stone sometimes. And um, just through that familiarity with poker, I ended up kind of being very connected to it. Um, and as an advertiser, before uh, July 20th of 2006, when everything changed, um, I was doing pretty well. But then overnight, I went from making like $1,200 a week doing that advertising to zero. And that was a very difficult day. I was actually at Foxwoods playing the day that I, I found that out. Um, I was playing 510 limit with a full kill. I remember that. So, you know, at that point I had to make a change in my life. And part of that change for me was moving from the East Coast out to the West Coast. And it was completely coincidental for me. I got into casinos because I was just looking for a job. And in a town called Deming, Washington, I was living in Bellingham, Washington, um, I was able to find a $75 blackjack course and my girlfriend at the time, now she's my ex-wife, uh, we took it together and, um, that was the beginning of all of it. So I, I actually learned table games first, then getting into poker. It was about maybe four months into my time. Um, they just kind of offered a poker dealer course. So I learned poker from somebody who, uh, I may one day open a room with, which would be fun. Um, but yeah, his name's Matt, and it was awesome out in Bellingham, Washington, or Deming, Washington, for the Nooksack River Casino. And unfortunately, the the casino doesn't exist anymore. But that was a, a great start for me to get into the industry. Awesome. I feel like an old fogey when I talk about my time dealing poker. But I um, when I started, I was dealing. Well, they put me on. Omaha high low and it was a four eight limit game. Um, it was insane because where where I was from, it was a lot of limit. And then two thousand three happened. Um, Money Maker won the World Series of Poker and then it exploded. And then all of a sudden, it converted from a lot of limit games here to no limit and tournament. And the tournament just took off. Um, through my time, I've never I never saw a the evolution of a game like poker, like from that one point to after something like that happened. Now, from when you were making videos, it was about eight years ago, right? Yeah, I started in 2012 is when I first released them. Yeah, so from from when you were making them in that, that time to now, have you seen any significant changes happen in the poker industry? Oh, yeah. Um, so... In 2009, um, that was the first poker room I was a full-time floor at. And uh, when I came down there, like promotions were bad beat jackpots, pretty much. And something that I really enjoy having been firsthand a part of was the introduction of the really big dollar amounts for high hands. And a lot of people in poker over time have kind of hated it. Um, but everyone's kind of gotten used to it because they know that it gets more people to play in the room. It's un unlike a bad beat jackpot where if it's just kind of sitting there, it doesn't affect the number of people that show up. The high hands actually do. So promotions between 2012 and 2020 before COVID, uh, the amount of promotions with high hands in rooms being like a regular thing has completely changed. It has dramatically affected the way that um, poker is played too. You know, there's a lot of people that treat it like a table game uh, where they literally come in and they're just trying to get whatever's being offered. And 
Um, the room that I worked at, uh, I remember the day that we first offered thousand dollar high hands every hour. It had never been done before anywhere. Um, the highest that had ever been done before that was $500. And, um, I was a supervisor that day and I was working closely with a shift manager. This was about a week before we released it. And we were scared to tell people because our competitors had, um, more players than us and they were able to just like turn on promotions in South Florida and now this this shift manager that I was working with is somebody that I was relatively close with, but he was kind of like there's a lot of casino managers. There, it's like you get a bad guy, but way underneath the bad guy is kind of a really good guy, and it's hard to it's hard to figure out who you're going to get in any given moment. But I just decided I was going to mess with him that day. So the instruction had been under no circumstances do we tell anybody we're doing this until like two days before, and it really bothered me because. Um, we were really slow when we opened our room. This was really close to right after we opened the room. And so uh, I just kind of decided I was going to go off the floor. Um, he was on the floor. There has to be one supervisor on the floor at any given time. And I called the director of the room, who I was also close with. Uh, the three of us, myself, the shift manager, and the director, helped open the room together. So we were kind of very familiar with each other in this way. And I called him, and I, I basically talked him into allowing us to announce it. <clears throat> but I didn't tell the shift manager. Um, and what I did was I talked a chip runner in the front of the room who had a microphone into making the announcement, knowing that the shift manager didn't know. And I just knew he was going to absolutely blow up. But we only had like three tables in there. And so I stepped off the floor so he couldn't contact me. And I turned my radio off. And uh, the very first $1,000 high hand announcement that was ever made the result of it was the shift manager actually walked over to the person who I had set up to make this announcement when we weren't supposed to, from what he understood, he, he had to, he had to stop and say, I just did what I was told to do. I announced to the players that were doing thousand dollar high hands. That's what Mark told me to do. And it was just a fun little like messing with, with somebody. I mean, there's a lot of stuff people don't understand that there's a lot of like razzing and all that type of stuff for casino employees. And, but yeah, it was it was really cool seeing like that very first day. We did not know what we were starting um, in order to get competition and get players. We didn't know what we were starting when we pushed thousand dollar high hands every hour. The room was absolutely packed and it just kept getting pushed and pushed and pushed until it was probably about 2017 or so when I was hearing about it in Vegas. They resisted it for so long. But yeah, that was uh, he was pretty mad at me for about a day. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, look, it's, it's like you build that camaraderie by doing stuff like that, you know, maybe don't do that at home, but <laughs> no, for sure. For sure. So, um, what do you, what do you miss the most about, uh, being on the floor and just being in that atmosphere and environment? So, yeah, I haven't actually worked as a supervisor since 2016. Um, now I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, I appreciate this question. Um, I was the the type of supervisor who was 100% um, employee focused. I I understood how to give proper guest service, but I was really there to take care of the people that I was working with, and I definitely miss that camaraderie. I still have it, um, and I I know you can relate to this because of what you described you're doing with your channel, and I love what you're doing. It's like taking care of people that are going to work every day that want to have a good place to work, and they want to feel like things are fair and. Um, I just I really enjoyed contributing to that environment and creating really strong, authentic friendships as a result of it. Um, I was not the person that was ever going to let a dealer feel like they're thrown under the bus. Now, look, in a 10 year career, there were definitely times where if I could go back, I would do things differently. But they were few and far between for the most part. And um, yeah, that that feeling like I could make everybody's experience better was the thing that I missed the most for sure. No, yeah, awesome. I, I do miss that too, that part of it. So, um, okay, so so now I'm going to say, okay, hey, so you're now the poker manager of the room and you have free reign. Um, what would you do to create the best overall poker room, better than your competitors, um, better than anybody else coming up? What is What would you do to create the best environment, not just for the customer, but just like you said, um, for the staff as well? Well, uh, there's a lot of different directions this could go. It's a loaded question and um, I like it. So 
you made it sound like I have free reign to do whatever I want, correct? Yes. yes. Well, the thing that I would do, um, I've been a tech entrepreneur now. I actually built a uh, promotion software myself with a uh, like an actual software development company, I would start incorporating tech into uh, poker in an experimental way to try to amplify the game in a lot of different ways. Um, it's it's kind of the fun vision. Like something that we think about with promotions is, uh, you know, high hand is a thing that you can do, but it's it's not very engaging long term. Like I picture something. Uh, and I don't mind sharing this with anybody because I don't know that I'm going to ever do it, but I would love for somebody to do it. If if you had a system where every hand was actually recorded by software and um, say every single time you get dealt ace king suited, it records it. Right. And if you get dealt ace king suited five times in a month, you get 20 bucks, something like that. You know, little things that can accumulate that can get get players to be more excited about little moments throughout the game of poker can really add a lot to it. And um, instead of just hoping you hit a royal flush, like what if you hope that you win five hands with seven deuce and unlock that bonus, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. There's there's a lot of things you can do with that the technology. Um, I was talking to a friend earlier today about the idea of uh, cards that, you know, there's so many times in poker where cards flash. And we talked about the idea of cards that you can't tell what they are by looking at either side. You need some kind of a glass device in order to see what the actual card is and you look through it, you know? Yeah. Um, solving some of those problems, making things better. Um, I, uh, By the time people are watching this, I might have started um, releasing these already. I have content now that is meant to aid the TDA rules. Um, the TDA rules are really, really well done. I love the TDA and I'm, I'm going through and building that right now. Um, you know, if I could do anything, uh, getting staff properly trained is, is another thing that I would definitely do. Um, there's a lot of dealer training, right? I'm true poker dealer. Okay. There's a lot of dealer training that's consistent. I'm so impressed with how much the industry has like latched onto my content and used it to improve everything. Um, but there's not a lot of, uh, supervisor training that's done. Most supervisors, when they get to, uh, that level, they're given a run through and then they're just kind of thrown into it. And, you know, poker rulings are very logic. It's like logic, logical problem solving. And it takes in a lot of factors. And there's so many different rules where the wording is not clear on its own for what it's really implying and what you're supposed to do with that information. And so, um, you know, these videos are meant to supplement that, but, uh, Training people properly is something I would really put a lot of attention to. I think a lot of people don't understand, even people in the industry just don't understand how difficult it is to teach poker. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of situations that happen. And it's like for me when I was dealing, like like I'd be dealing late night and there'd be a lot of people that are drinking and whatnot, and all of a sudden like things that I've never even seen in like years would happen and be like, how did this happen? And for like a trainer to actually think about, okay, this can potentially happen. This can potentially happen uh, is so, it's so difficult. And like, that's why for me, I say it's harder to teach than like a structured game like roulette or a game like craps. That's why I have a lot of respect for what you're doing because, you know, you're sitting there and you're, you're going through hands, but it is so difficult when you don't have the people that are there around you to kind of participate and, and give you that atmosphere. So. Yeah, and I, I appreciate you bringing this up. Um, that's one of the nice things that helps this. It doesn't make it uh, that easy, but it does help being able to tell poker dealers just call the floor. But then the thing that I was just saying was floor training is very, very poor in general across all poker rooms. Uh, like there's very few exceptions. Maybe Aria does it well. The TDA does it well for the high stakes tournaments and stuff. But like floor training in general is it's just not done that much. And it, they're the ones that have to really know every single detail because they're the ones that you call when something complicated happens. Um, but I mean, to, to, to speak to your point, you know, you said you've been dealing for a period of time, a long time, and things still come up that you'd never seen when you were experiencing that. I had a dealer on my live session yesterday um, on True Poker Dealer tell me, hey, I've just got my first job. I'm starting my first table in 40 minutes. What advice do you have for me? I'm like, whoa. <laughs> I told him though, this happens all the time. I told him, listen, there's gonna be a lot of stuff 
that you've never seen before, you've never been trained on, just understand that that's pretty normal and just do your best and learn all those things as you go. And your first you know, week to a month as a poker dealer is just a lot of learning. Um, and that's the state of how things are right now. And um, I'm not sure that it can completely change, but yeah, it, we, we can make it better and YouTube's a great place for that. I agree. I think that um, the other thing that I really appreciate um, with regards to your channel is the fact that you actually teach the technique. So w were there some people like throughout your career that kind of showed you that or was that just something that you kind of developed over a period of time through experience? So I originally learned a lot of my mechanics from a blackjack instructor. Like I mentioned, that was my very first exposure. And I like it that way because poker procedure is not taken as serious as table games procedure. But at the end of the day, you're dealing with the same chips, the same type of bank. Um, like a lot of the stuff is the same. The cards are still cards. And so I decided that because some poker rooms take it, the procedure as serious, I was going to teach it that way. Um, so a lot of that is from table games, but it's also partially, like at least in 2012, it was partially universally accepted as poker procedure as well. And I just basically assumed that if I pushed it that way, it would turn into poker procedure. Mm -hmm. But I have come across so many different techniques and methods over the years from so many different people. Um, that first floor job I was talking about, that shift manager that I was referring to, um, that I, I played the joke on. He was phenomenally helpful with a bunch of different experience from different places. And we had like 90 dealers and 12th floor in that poker room in South Florida that I'm referring to. Like we opened the poker room together, all this stuff. The collective experience from all of those people, like I never said, I know what's right all the time. And I always tried to learn from as many of them as I could. We would do competitions for dealing and um, like all of these different things added up, turned into True Poker Dealer. And, and then I had people come from all over the world and criticize True Poker Dealer in different ways. The feedback on there is phenomenal, but a lot of people still say, hey, uh, I do it this way. This person does it this way. I've been training it for 20 years and I do it this way. The WSOP says to do it this way. Like, and I just keep incorporating more and more of those techniques into it in order to make it more well-rounded and universal. But there's still not one right way to deal poker. And I have to remind people over and over again, if you see somebody dealing in a casino, um, any version of poker, and the house says that's the right way to deal it, that's professional, right? I can't say it's wrong. It's being done in a professional casino. And so um, that's actually one of the challenges is even knowing what procedure to it, it exists out there. I have to be very aware of all the different things. Even though I haven't been in the industry, I probably have as much unique access to all the different variations of what's being done in poker rooms as anybody because of all the comments and feedback I get between YouTube and a little bit on Facebook and, you know, these other different places as well. Yeah, no, for sure. So what was your favorite game to deal uh, poker wise? I'm not talking about the floor, but you know, it's really funny. Uh, so I spent probably a combined three and a half years dealing over the 10 years in the industry and I dealt table games, craps, all that stuff. Now, Specifically speaking, I didn't deal Pot Limit Omaha very much until the very end. And I found that game to be really nice to deal because it's a slow moving game where there's no rake. Like I say all the time, poker dealers are professional change makers. When you deal one to no limit, you're constantly making change throughout the hand, like all the time. Um, sometimes you get four people to throw red chips in, in a one to no limit game and it's just crazy. Pot Limit Omaha, once you learn how to do it, you're just doing some calculation stuff. It's not that hard. It's kind of chill, and the tips are great. So, um, because it's always five five and higher. I mean, occasionally you'll see one two or or two two games, but I never dealt those. So, mm -hmm. um, I did enjoy that uh, probably more than anything else. Yeah. Why? Um, why did you go? Well, I don't want to say why did you go. Why was it poker and not table games? Because you know, like a lot of people. Um, when they're in the industry, they have that choice. They they get to that fork in the road. It's like, well, do you want to be a houseman or do you want to be a pit manager and move up that way? And it seems like lateral positioning. But for you, what was what was it that made you gravitate towards poker? 
Well, originally, before I took the course in poker, um, I went up to the poker manager. It was literally just a three-table poker room in Deming, Washington um, that was a part of the, ta the entire table games department. And I said, hey, I'd like to deal poker because I liked poker. I used to play it as a kid with my dad growing up, and then I played a bunch of online poker, and I played a bunch of casinos. And um, like I never played a ton of table games. So um, when I got into it there and I learned it, they quickly, because, you know, if you have one big pool of people that are dealing both table games and poker, anybody that cares about poker, they're just going to be like, yeah, we'll put you in the poker room because you're going to get get it more and you're going to handle situations better. So I became a dual rate after about five months at that job and I was dual rating between table games and poker, but they would have me open and close the room sometimes. Yeah. So then when I actually moved across the country from Washington to Florida, um, and I was looking for a job. Florida was an absolute mess when it came to gambling back <clears throat> in 2009. Um, I was looking for any job when I moved out here. Um, cost of living was really low at the time. It was right after the 2006, 2007, um, I guess you call it a recession. I don't know. But um, basically... It was either go deal table games at the Seminole Tribe, which that was the only place you could do it in Florida with an enormous amount of competition, or go to one of the many poker rooms that were down here that were just starting up. When I came to Florida, they had no limit games with a hundred dollar max buy-in, no matter what the game was. Um, and they were opening rooms, and it's just I don't know if you'd even heard that they did this, but. Uh, Florida poker for my first like seven months or so, maybe even a little longer. It was literally like people would play five, 10, no limit with a hundred dollar buy-in. That's, that's what it was. It was absolutely silly. That's and you, yeah. would have, you would have full tables sit down and everybody would go all in for like 10 hands in a row just to build up a stack um, so that they could actually play the game. And it would just be gambling to see who would end up with that amount of money. People just pull out a hundred at a time. But um that was it was fun to be a part of that. I got to be a part of opening a room. I got to be a full time floor. Um, they actually offered me the shift manager position and I turned it down because I didn't feel qualified for it. Um, and I ended up doing that a, a couple of years later. But um, I was definitely passionate about poker because of the online um, advertising and playing and all that stuff, too. But if I'm being honest, I could easily have gone down the table games route. Um, but then once I got into poker, it was just, you know, I learned more and more about it. Yeah, no, for sure.